Hey everyone, I'm David Ryan Polgar. I'm the founder and director of the nonprofit All Tech is Human. All Tech is Human is focused on building the responsible tech pipeline, making it more diverse, multidisciplinary, and aligned with the public interest. Today, we want to have a conversation with Julia Mann Grant, who is Australia's e safety commissioner. We're going to be talking all about Australia's push around safety by design. But since Julie, since we mentioned the e-safety commissioner, that's something people might be wondering, well, what is an e-safety commissioner? So uh, sure. I'd love to have you explain your role, what you do uh, in this role as the e-safety commissioner. Right. Um, well, as you can tell from my accent, I'm actually American born. Um, <laughs> I've been in Australia for about 20 years and I spent more than two decades in the high technology sector. Uh, I got my start with Microsoft in the mid 1990s in Washington, D.C. as one of their first lobbyists right before the whole antitrust trial um, happened again, was involved in shaping Section 230 of the CDA and uh, the antitrust trial, of course, but also um, helping put together the first online safety summit with the Clinton uh, White House all those years ago. Um, I spent 17 years there. Uh, I spent a few years with Twitter and then at Adobe. Um, and uh, then I was tapped to become the Australia's e-safety commissioner, which is the world's first online safety regulator. And our mission is to help our citizens have um, more safe and positive experiences online. So we have a, a citizen-facing set of services and regulatory schemes to take down seriously harmful content. Mm -hmm. um, that's our protect um, area. So um, child sexual abuse material, so we're, we're the nation's hotline, very much like the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children is in the US or the Canadian um, Child Protection Center or the IWF in, in the UK. There are sister mm -hmm. hotlines. Uh, we deal with um, pro-terrorist content and in the wake of the Christchurch massacre, um, abhorrent violent content. And we also have some pretty significant ISP blocking powers um, in the event of an online crisis event happening again. Um, then we have um, powers to take down what we call image-based abuse, coll mm -hmm. colloquially known as revenge porn. We don't call it revenge porn because we feel that's inherently victim blaming revenge for what and not porn for the um, prurient interest, right? So mm -hmm. we have about an 85% success rate in terms of getting our citizens um, intimate images and video shared without consent down from thousands of websites um, around the world. Um, and then we have uh, the world's one and only youth-based cyberbullying scheme. So when a child is seriously intimidated, threatened, humiliated, um, or intimidated, and they report to a social media site, it doesn't come down. We serve as that safety net who can advocate on behalf of the child and get that content taken down. We just had um, some new powers given to us. Um, we're taking a foray into serious adult cyber abuse, okay. um, but it's at a pretty high standard so that we're not um, interfering with freedom of expression. It has to be intent to seriously harm, but will allow us to consider intersectional factors because we know that women and those of various ethnicities, re religion, sexualities are disproportionately targeted. So we will be able to tackle some of that. Um, and then we'll be holding the companies to account through something called the basic online safety expectations. So that's protection. We do a lot of work in the prevention and education space because we want things uh, we don't want the harms happening in the first place. Right. And then what we're going to talk about today is that sort of proactive and systemic change. So we're trying to stay ahead of technology trends and threats so we can um, assess these and build these into our investigative schemes and also our prevention materials. So you'll see a range of position statements on everything from deep fakes to um, how immersive technologies can be misused. But safety by design is probably our most significant um, initiative. And I'd be really happy to take you on that journey of our journey because it is yeah. a marathon and it's not a sprint. That is true. It is definitely a marathon. And that's actually what I love to dig in as well as you went over kind of your extensive history with some of the major tech companies like Microsoft and Twitter. And then also you mentioned the involvement of uh, Section 230, the Communications Decency Act of 1996. So it kind of begs the question is what has really changed? What have you seen uh, since you've been kind of on the ground floor 
of a lot of these developments that now uh, have kind of come back and we've reflected differently upon some of the norms that we kind of baked into the orish, uh, original kind of thinking around what, what a platform is and how we might regulate or not regulate some of these platforms. Right. Well, I mean, in the six years we've um, been in operation, we've seen the sea change. But if I go, go all the way back a quarter of a century and I think about, um, you know, tech, technology policy wasn't even a practice back mm -hmm. then. So there was just a small handful of us. You know, Microsoft was big. AOL was big. You know, AltaVista, <laughs> Yahoo. You know, social media was not a thing, obviously, in 1996. And really, the internet was just on the cusp. And there was a genuine fear in industry that if it was overtaxed and overregulated, that it wouldn't reach its full potential. And that's that was really the genesis of shaping Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, so that whilst we wanted to all protect children from online predators, um, we, you know, Companies didn't want to take um, the liability for what users did on their platforms. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg was probably a teenager at that time and um, Facebook was on a twinkle in their eye. So I, I guess this just goes to show you um, how indeed technology does outpace policy mm -hmm. and you know how outdated Section 230 is. Um, and even, you know, my own view is even if you, you probably going to need to start from scratch and look at the environment comprehensively to really, really tackle these issues. And this sounds strange for me to say as a, a regulator now or a poacher turned gamekeeper, but we're never going to regulate or arrest our way out of these uh, online toxic toxicity issues because you're talking about human beings um mm -hmm. you know it's, it's playing out on um you know on, on these technology platforms so technology providers and the platforms definitely have a role to play and they do need to take responsibility and this is where safety by design really comes in that mm -hmm. the premise behind that is you know, if you build the digital roads, you need to be erecting the digital guardrails, maybe occasionally policing those roads for dangerous drivers so others don't end up becoming the casualties. But what's interesting about the online world we have today is not only do the platforms um, provide these digital roads, but they also provide the vehicles. Yeah. And um, if you think back to uh, more than 50 years ago and Ralph Nader's unsafe at any speed, mm -hmm. this is where we are today. I mean, the mantra of Facebook at one point was let's move fast and break things and profits at all costs. Um, that's an ethos that needs to change. Um, that doesn't mean we can't be innovative. Mm -hmm. We can't be first to market. We can't, um, you know, do things quickly. We just need to do things a little bit more mindfully. We've, we know what the online harms are. We have for well over 20 years. We know how the platforms have been weaponized. Mm -hmm. What we need to do is mindfully assess risk at the front end, build in the safety protections. So bake them in rather than bolt them on after the, uh, the damage has been done. My observation in my almost 30 years working at the intersection of technology policy and safety is that companies tend to move when there's a genuine threat to their revenue, to mm -hmm. their reputation, or to regulation. Um, I think we're now getting to the point where you know, the UK also has an online harms bill. Um, Canada is looking at the e-safety model. We're talking to Korea and Singapore. We're probably going to have a network of online safety commissioners and mm -hmm. regulators like we do data protection authorities in the next five to 10 years. Well, and then you, you mentioned the idea of, well, one, the term even safety by design and how safety should be essential for just any type of platform, because that's the, the bedrock of how we you know can, can safely uh, communicate. Uh, it kind of reminds me of a situation that uh, Twitter had a few years ago. Obviously, your own background with Twitter, I believe is in, uh, what was this, 2016, uh, when there was a lot of talk of them selling to uh, Disney. Uh, that fell through. And one of the reasons why it fell through, uh, at least from the, re the reports uh, around this uh, deal, was that uh, they didn't think the platform was uh, safe enough. There was just uh, too many, uh, you know, too many issues around trolls and, and problematic behavior and content uh, shared. So 
do you think that tech companies right now, I've seen your position, you get to interface with a lot of tech companies. Do you think that they're uh, viewing safety as central to the product or, is, or do you think we still have a long ways to go? I still think we have a well, way to go, but I think it's starting to change and mm -hmm. it needs to change. Um, you know, based on my 25 years of experience, um, and I worked in a division called Trustworthy Computing for a while at, um, at Microsoft. And just to give you a sense, um, I, safety has always kind of been the, um, the, the, the poor step, stepchild, if you will, to security and privacy. And um, I saw that firsthand at, at, at Microsoft. Um, I don't know if you remember, you know, back in the late 1990s, how um, Windows was considered to be riddled with security vulnerabilities. Um, so in 2001, you know, Bill Gates issued a decree um, around trustworthy computing, and he took every engineer and technical person off every product and there was a laser focus on recoding hundreds and millions of lines mm -hmm. of Windows codes to code out the vulnerabilities. And then they set up um, uh, uh, this trustworthy computing division. Um, there were about 400 people you know, when I was working in there, huge amount of people on security, um, a very good um, sizable portion of people working on accessibility and privacy. And there was just a handful of us working on safety. So I did bring safety by design to the leadership um, at Microsoft probably in 2011. And they I've got to say they did do some really great stuff around safety in the mid 2000s. Photo DNA is mm -hmm. uh, one yeah. of those efforts. The child exploitation tracking system. You know, they were doing work with ICMEC and training law enforcement and developing a digital crimes unit a long time ago. But um, the attention to online safety ebbs and flows over time, particularly as they uh, were leaning into becoming an enterprise company. And uh, the leadership is no longer there, but I remember at the time saying, hey, we're doing security by design with these product review products and privacy by design. Can't we just do safety by design? And they were mm -hmm. like, what even is that? I'm like, well, trust and safety is really about personal harms happening mm -hmm. to our customers. And I got the kind of the guffaw, well, we're never going to be a social media site, Julie. Why would we do that? That's a waste of time. Um, and so that that really stuck with me. That kind of made me think, you know what? I, I actually think this is really important. It makes good business sense. Um, why wouldn't we do this? And then I mm -hmm. sort of realized that my time had probably run out there. Um, and it was amazing when I landed at Twitter. They thought I was incredible because you know they were really just a small little startup. Um, and as I was joining, um, you know, ironically, there there was a tragic situation in which a, um, a a model who was the presenter for Australia's Next Top Model was very open about uh, depression. She had had a nervous breakdown. Um, she got some help. She came back on Twitter and just terrible, terrible, as you know, uh, trolling. You know, yeah. why don't you put your head in an oven and finish the job? Just terrible. She ended up committing suicide and it became oh. known as the Twitter suicide. And that's when the petition started to create the eSafety office. But I happened to be interviewing for Twitter at the time to run their public policy, philanthropy and safety work in um, the Asia Pacific region. Um, and I remember saying to my boss at the time um, or the guy about to hire me, I need to know that you're going to be committed to investing in safety because I'm not going to be able to represent you or defend Twitter um, if this isn't happening. And you know, from two, 2014, 2015, there were some there were some really good innovations. I mean, things that things like the mute button, mm -hmm. things like the, it used to take two and a half minutes to fill out a report form on a on a you know short form microblogging site. While I was there, they enabled third party um, reporting um, and they um, they got that down to 30 seconds. Um, I remember being shocked that uh, with re with revenge porn reports that the person whose image was on Twitter had to prove that by uploading their license or other form of ID that that was the person there. The burden was on the victim to prove that was mm -hmm. them rather than, well, 
we'll take this down while we assess whether or not this you, because we know that the longer those kinds of images are up, the more damage it's been done. Mm -hmm. They change, they change that around, but it, it, it takes a real um, change in mentality and frankly, a change in culture. And so that's really what safety by design is all about. Um, it's about changing that ethos um, and working with industry um, and doing this for industry rather than to industry. Well, and that's the part that I want to bring up because you also mentioned uh, Microsoft's photo DNA around a lot of uh, abusive uh, content uh, shared. Uh, that's also typically brought up because it's an example where Microsoft shared it with the larger uh, community, right? With companies yeah. that normally yeah. you would have been hyper competitive with. And I've seen Microsoft is never seen as not a competitive company, right? So do you find that same level of sharing is, is going on with, uh, with the companies that you're talking to now, or is that something that you think you need to see more of, right? Is there a lot of, of back and forth with best practices in, in this uh, trust and safety? Well, I don't think there we're all totally aligned yet when it comes to safety. And there are a couple of reasons for that. When I was in the industry, we used to talk about coopetition. Mm. So we, um, we cooperate on um, a range of things where there was a, a societal good and then we would mm -hmm. compete on other things. And if, if you go back to the, um, the idea of automobiles and how they felt like they were being forced to embed seat belts, you know, 50 years ago and the auto industry really recoiled against that. You know, now we step into our cars and we take for granted that the yeah. seat belts are there, that the airbags are going to deploy, that the brakes are going to be effective. And companies actually differentiate themselves and market themselves based on automobile safety. Um, and, you know, the, the hope is people can certainly vote with their feet if a platform is too ugly, too toxic, they can move elsewhere. But it does have to do with critical mass. But what we're seeing with companies now is that um, they'll cooperate on issues where tech, where where um, content is blatantly illegal, like mm -hmm. child sexual abuse material. So we've got some, um, we've got the Technology Coalition, the We Protect Global Alliance is a multi-stakeholder uh, forum. Um, you've got them sharing images across industry. Um, you've got the same thing happening now with the GIF CT and countering violent extremism. All of that, of course, came about due to you know government pressure to, right. to tackle these issues. Um, so when we took on the role of, of um, image-based abuse, of course, there's CCRI and Rain and other organizations in in the U.S. doing really wonderful work around this. Um, I tried to convince the platforms to start sharing image-based abuse because we saw scenarios where a really determined predator, uh, particularly where relationship retribution was involved, they weren't just going to post your intimate images onto Instagram. They were going to go to Twitter and they were going to go to YouTube and to have that sharing. And I, I got a definitive pushback. This isn't, this isn't patently illegal. Um, Julie, this is not something we're, we're going to necessarily share intelligence on. Um, mm -hmm. Tried to get the same thing going around volumetric cross-platform attacks, mm -hmm. uh, which we see a lot, saw a lot of during the um, COVID period. So we're, I guess, as industry, we're moving in the right direction, but we're not totally aligned. Um, and, and you actually, you saw the lobbying um, that hap that was happening around the UK online harms bill, mm -hmm. and um, the industry was able to convince the UK government to you know focus on illegal content, but not just content that is harmful. And I thought to myself, you're acknowledging as industry that this is harmful content, but you don't want government to take action. That seems really strange to me because the people being harmed are their users or their customers, mm -hmm. if you will. Well, it always seems like when, when we're discussing social media, because I think you also use the line, we can't necessarily regulate our, our way out of this. Uh, this got to be kind of a, a combination of, of tools that, that we're utilizing and hence why you'd have something adopted like safety by design. But I'm, I'm kind of curious on that is this, this argument always seems to be caught in the idea of, well, who do we trust more? Or who do we trust least, right? Should we have our legislative branch, or let's say if you're, you're in the United States, uh, focus on this issue or should, should we leave it up to self-regulation? 
Do you think that's becoming kind of an outdated uh, argument, or where do you where do you see this this headed? Because I love to kind of dip into your kind of kind of brand because it seems like uh, your work in Australia seems to be taking kind of a, a very forward thinking approach. Uh, you know, I don't see a lot of other uh, e-safety commissioners right now in other countries. So it seems like you're you're taking something that can be modeled, uh, you know, worldwide. Yeah, and we're doing a lot of work around um, international capacity building and sharing our model. There's now one other uh, e-safety commissioner, and she is in Fiji. We've got an official partnership with her, but of course, the the UK is on the cusp. Mm -hmm. um, Canada, as I said, is looking at our model. Um, we did speak to the White House Gender Policy Council about some of the work we're doing around um, technology facilitated abuse and women experiencing domestic and family violence, as well as online harassment. And there's a lot of interest there. Uh, you know, of course, when we were putting our image based abuse scheme together, I guess our North Star or the real uh, inspiration for some of the great work that was happening was actually um, when Kamala Harris was Attorney General of California and some of the remarkable work she did in the cyber exploitation space, which is what we call image based abuse. So she brings that legacy along with her and um, mm -hmm. Hopefully that will propel things forward. We know that the legend, you know, what comes from the the White House and then what's done in the legislative branch yeah. of Congress um, isn't always aligned. Right. Um, but we have seen Jackie Spear and the Shield Act mm -hmm. and um, some some movement there, and obviously the the hearings around antitrust. But I guess what I'd say is, um, I I see yes, we do regulate. The, um, the the platforms and um, we have a big stick that we can use when we want to. But my approach is collaboration first, mm -hmm. uh, as as they like to say in the South. Um, you catch more flies with honey than you do with vinegar, and um, I think there is a shared objective. Um, no one wants a toxic platform. No one wants harm happening on their product, um, and what we really want to do is lift the safety standards. And we didn't feel that legislation or regulation alone would um, impel companies um, to do that. I mean, just look at the FTC, you know, the $5 billion um, fine against Facebook. I believe right. their stock price went up after that because it was a drop in the bucket. Um, but over time, companies will start to care if people walk with their feet, if they're broken up. Mm -hmm. you know, regulatory, the revenue um, damage. I mean, we saw that happen with YouTube when the um, violent extremism and the, the child sexual abuse material was served against YouTube videos and you had advertisers leaving in droves. They lost about a billion worth of revenue in a week and they changed those algorithms pretty fast. So mm -hmm. the question is, why did that have to happen um, for them to change their algorithm? algorithm? And I think Zoom's another perfect example of um, that tech wreck moment that seems to be inevitable, but doesn't need to be. Mm -hmm. uh, look at how beautifully they scaled. They had 10 million daily active users in December 2019. I think by March of 2020, it was up to 200 million and then 300 million in April. But then they had this unfortunate Zoom bombing phenomenon. In fact, yeah. we had a group of kindergartners who were doing remote learning and um, there, um, some malicious adult um, showed them terrorist content that they couldn't unsee. Now that's really, really yeah. damaging. So they had to take that offline. And um, you know, I know my agency, we're still not allowed to use Zoom because there are fears about their safety, privacy, and security. So how do you get, how do you calculate that loss of trust and that loss mm -hmm. of business? And um, you'll remember the CEO sort of said, um, as he was reflecting on what had happened, well, you know, I'd never thought of um, online harassment before. And then you kind of think to yourself, I know how a founder thinks they're, they're excited about the technology and they just want to bring it to market and get their revenue and, you know, lock it in. But how can you build an interactive platform where, where humans are interacting and not think that something might go wrong? Um, but that's why, again, like the investment community and the VC community can serve as an important lever. They're often the adults in the room. 
they want to manage their own risk and they also want to be um, increasingly investing ethically. So safety by design is a really important consideration for them too. And we've got some um, tools, including due diligence clauses and checklists mm -hmm. for startups um, that they can use. Well, that's one way I always like to think about it, right? If you're, if you're expecting hockey, uh, hockey stick growth, you have to make sure that the ice doesn't kind of crack. But I mean, similar to Zoom, you also had Clubhouse, but that could surprise a lot of people too, because it also seemed like uh, safety was not necessarily central to their initial kind of outrolling of their platform, which became uh, incredibly uh, popular during the uh, pandemic. So do you think this is something that's maybe not uh, impacting the kind of startup community enough? Or where, where do you see this as uh, the potential to to really have a, a major kind of impact uh, with right. something beneficial? Well, I guess it, you see the same story playing out over and over again. And my belief is that that tech wreck moment doesn't need to be inevitable. Yeah. Um, and uh, again, I guess this is why we want to we want to promote the concept of safety by design in the first place. But given my years in industry, I knew that this wasn't something a small little government agency in Australia could do to the companies that we had mm -hmm. to bring them along on part of the journey. And so that's why this has thus far been a, a, a three year journey yeah. um, with the industry. We've engaged with 180 different entities, mostly uh, tech companies, but also advocates and academics and other governments. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, what we did first is we sat down, we actually had four sets of principles and we ended up engaging and whittling them down to three. And we wanted to make sure that there was a safety by design principles based framework that was actionable, it was achievable and it was gonna have real impact. And again, we needed the buy-in from companies to agree that this was something that they could do and they would do mm -hmm. um, and that they could sell to their their leadership. So what we ended up with, um, you know, uh, in terms of the, the, the principles in 2018 uh, were three major concepts. And then there are different um, sort of, I guess, deliverables and um, uh, KPIs underneath mm -hmm. them. The first is service provider responsibility. And of course, the idea is that the burden of safety should never fall solely upon the user. Mm -hmm. And that every attempt must be made to ensure that the online harms are understood, assessed, and addressed in the service de design and provision, the, the design, development, and deployment of the technology. The second area of consideration is user empowerment and autonomy, which I think speaks directly to the dignity of users and the need to design features and functionality to preserve fundamental consumer and human rights. So, um, you know, this could be something as basic as just making sure that your report abuse, fun you have a report abuse function, but that it's very discoverable, it's easy to use and navigate in, in, in quick. And then, of course, I, I think what is a hallmark of any robust approach to safety by design or safety is through transparency and accountability. And this gives some specific um, ideas about how companies can can achieve more than selective transparency and much more radical transparency and to be accountable for what happens on their platforms. So we had a lot of the big players um, sign off um, publicly. Um, you know, Facebook started doing some safety by design jams, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, Google and um, Twitter, and um, you know, Snap really leaned in. Nextdoor really leaned in. Um, you know, we had Sarah Fire down here. She's been really engaged, and you know, they've been very focused on. You know, they're an example of a company that makes kindness. Um, a key element of what they do and creating community. Um, you know, it's it would be pretty damaging um, if, to have too much toxicity um, in an online community that's meant right. to build community um, in your your local neighborhoods. So, um, you know, it's interesting. I was in New York, um, did an event at the the UN where I introduced the concept of safety by design, and people were like, "Huh." And so I started thinking, how how do I talk about this and illustrate it in ways that are that make sense to people beyond the automobile analogies? But when you think about it, product liability laws have been around for so long that mm -hmm. you know prevent toys you know 
toys from exploding in our children's faces. Um, we've got food safety standards that are guided um, internationally so that you don't poison people or make people sick. Isn't it crazy that the internet and technology has almost become an essential utility, but none of the same requirements exist. Um, and, you know, I think unless companies do start to do better and lift their overall standards around online safety, they are, they're going to be regulated and they're going to be regulated in ways that they don't want to be regulated. So, you know, I always kind of have a sly smile when, when I, I hear Facebook say, regulate us because you know in my my dealings with them they definitely don't want to be regulated and they'll push back on um provisions that that they don't want um when they don't want to do things and they don't want to set a precedent and have there be a domino effect so really what they're saying is um regulate us but regulate us in the way that we want to be regulated mm -hmm. well if you're you're actually building products that are safer um, you're assessing the risks up front and putting the protections in at the front end before the damage has been done. There's not going to be much for a regulator to do. Um, and, and and this is where we decided, one, with the startups, we would, we would work on the VCs and the investors as an important lever, but, for, but that we still need to fix a lot of what's happening with the mid-tier and enterprise companies mm -hmm. too. No one's a paragon of virtue when it comes to um, building for safety or doing better at safety. We see a lot of um, product features that come out with great public affairs or public relations fanfare, um, but then we never see anything uh, back to transparency and accountability. Like what is the take up of this feature? Did it actually work? What's the level of success? We never sort of see that kind of follow up and then we don't see that sharing. So we talked to a number of com companies that were engaged in this and we said, what if, what if we developed a set of tools and we worked with you and we, we worked on a framework um, and, but what we wanted to do was not point the finger and say, you're not doing well. We wanted companies to go on their own journey um, and, um, and this is where we develop the um, interactive assessment tools, uh, where we put them through um, five different modules and areas of question. Um, if you're an enterprise company, the most that will take you is about seven hours and it will spit out a form and it will surface up best practice in terms of where, you, where are your weaknesses and then what are some of the best practices or good practices you can learn from. For a startup, um, our startup tool takes about an hour and um, I would argue that this is some of the best, the, the best hour spent most startups will ever take because it's meant to be much more educative. What is on, how do we define online harms? What do they look like? Mm -hmm. How do they manifest? How are platforms typically weaponized? What does your business model canvas look like? Um, all, all of those types of things. But the, the five areas um, are structure and leadership and, you know, my contention is if Mark Zuckerberg or Jack Dorsey or Satya Nadella or um, Sandra Pashai, any of them said, we are going to make our products and services safe. That's gonna be a, um, a huge priority. Yes, there might be some give and take in terms of usability and other, uh, other areas, but I believe they would be much safer. So even if we do a modicum of this, um, it, 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 takes, it takes people through um, structure and leadership, what kind of internal processes and procedures are needed, what does good moderation, escalation, and enforcement look like, how do you actually build those user empowerment tools, and then again, it drills down into transparency and accountability. Um, so, you know, and, and we are seeing more companies putting out transparency reports, but um, I think there, um, some of the transparency reports are a little opaque and they're selective in, in terms of um, the KPIs um, that they use or the measures that they use. We don't always get the overall picture. Mm -hmm. So again, that's an area where I think they can compete to do better. That actually uh, leads us into our final question for our discussion. I know we could continue on and on, but that's where I'd love to have you uh, let everyone know where people can access some of these 
safety by design uh, tools, uh, the assessment tool and other information and then follow along with some of the work that, you're, that you have kind of leading uh, as the e-safety commissioner in Australia. But the final question is, you mentioned this safety by design process taking the last three years, talking to all these companies, uh, obviously uh, dealing with a lot of back and forth to fine tune some of these issues. So when I call you up three years from now, uh, and hopefully we have another discussion like this, uh, what do you hope uh, has changed? Where are you three years from now with, with Safety by Design? Well, we really hope that Safety by Design does go viral. And I, I think we're starting to notice um, more adoption and uptake um, already. So I'll start with the first question, mm -hmm. esafety.gov.au, um, Safety by Design, or just Google or Bing, eSafety and uh, Safety by Design. Um, you'll find that there. Uh, just last week, you, the UK put out um, some um, guidance on safety by design principles. Um, and and um, I think we're seeing lots of synergies. Um, we had the G7 leaders agree that safety by design was a fundamental component of corporate social responsibility in their internet principles. Um, the Five Eyes has taken this on. And then, you know, we've seen incredibly positive um, and uh, glowing feedback, really, from the, um, the companies that we've worked with. Um, and, you know, I think, frankly, they were surprised that um, a small little government agency in Australia would um, be able to, you know, put out an interactive piece of software, a technology tool that um, um, Silicon Valley would adopt. And so we knew it had to be uh, really top shelf um, in terms of its development. Um, it has to be useful um, to companies to want to use it. So we hope more companies take a spin through the tool. Um, the tool is going to continue to iterate and be interactive. And um, we want to continue surfacing up good practice. Mm -hmm. We want to work with more companies. Yeah, we want companies to succeed at being safer. And uh, I don't think we need to take the big stick to make them do that. We just need people to stop and be a bit, little bit mindful and then think about what works for their work, not trying to be prescriptive about what companies do or how they achieve those safety ends. We just want them to be um, aware of the risks and to mindfully um, engineer out misuse. Yeah. Well, well said. And, and again, I appreciate uh, some of the leadership you've taken on a global stage with safety by design, uh, really causing a butterfly effect, hopefully of improving social media. So Julie Van Grant, the eSafety Commissioner of Australia. Thank you for uh, coming on to talk to me. Again, uh, my name is Dave Ryan Polgar with All Tech is Human. Uh, we'll continue on and send some of the resources connected with safety by design, but thank you. Thank you.